Hello, Church History friends. My name is Barb Walden, and I'm speaking to you from my home in Indianapolis, Indiana. Tonight, I have the joy of welcoming you to the first lecture in the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation's Summer Lecture Series. We greatly appreciate you tuning in this evening to hear Andrew Bolton speak. Before we begin tonight's lecture, though, I want to introduce you to a few of the co-hosts. First, we have Peter Smith, who is uh, tuning in from Michigan. Peter is a member of the Board of Directors, and he is also a co-host for our annual bus tour. He's gone on several bus tours and has played that uh, pastoral care for us. He is a very, very valuable member of the Board of Directors, and he'll be acting as co-host tonight keeping an eye on the Q&A and the chats. So welcome, Peter. I also want to introduce you to another co-host, and that's Megan Reed. Megan is working on her master's degree at Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. She currently serves as a student intern for the Kirtland Temple, and she'll be assisting behind the scenes throughout the lecture series. She is the brains behind this online adventure, and we wouldn't be able to manage the program tonight without her. So thank you, thank you, Megan. I should also point out that Megan is here tonight thanks to your generous donations given to the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation in support of the Alma Blair Internship Program. So thank you for your generosity. And speaking of donations, this lecture series is also a benefit for the Community of Christ Historic Sites. Although the sites are temporarily closed for public safety due to COVID-19, the stories from church history and the preservation and maintenance of the historic sites marches on. Donations from the lecture series tonight will help support and preserve Community of Christ historic sites. Now for the main event, our evening lecture. Tonight, Andrew Bolton is posing two questions for us. Who was right about World War I? 19-year-old F. Henry Edwards, a priest and trainee accountant in Birmingham, England, or 41-year-old President F. M. Smith, a PhD? And secondly, what can we learn from F. Henry Edwards and F. M. Smith's stories for today's Community of Christ as we wrestle with the question of nonviolence? Now, who is this Andrew Bolton, you ask? Andrew has a PhD, but is a fellow countryman of F. Henry Edwards. He is neither 19 or 41. He loves church history and is passionate about the peace mission of Community of Christ. Welcome, Andrew, and thank you for joining us this evening. I'll turn the microphone over to you as we look forward to hearing your thoughts on F. Henry and his father-in-law, Frederick Madison Smith. Thank you, Barbara. I'm very pleased to join you all this evening. I see in the chats names that I recognize, some of whom are being on the Historic Sites bus tours. Hello to all of you. And I saw Tim all the way from Tunkari, Australia. I so appreciate the work of the Board of Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation. They're some of the loveliest members of the church and an utter joy to work and be with. We're also very grateful for Barbara Walden's leadership of the Historic Sites Foundation. She's so creative in advancing church history. So thank you, Barb. We begin tonight's story outside the notorious Wormwood Scrubs Prison. HMP stands for today Her Majesty's, but in F. Henry Edwards' time, His Majesty's Prison and Wormwood Scrubs. The good news is that your $10 has paid for your flight across the Atlantic and for your bus ride from Heathrow Airport to here. So here we are outside Wormwood Scrubs. Imagine I'm from the BBC. And inside here, a 19 year old man sentenced to hard labor on an inadequate diet was forced to be here because he refused to kill people in World War II, World War I. So the young man, 19 years old, was F. Henry Edwards. And the period of history we're talking about 
is World War I, 1914 to 1918. And we've just remembered the 100th year anniversary of that terrible war. F. Henry was a prisoner in Wenwood Scrubs prison, uh, hard labor, and a future RLBS church leader. But neither he, nor the church, nor his captors knew that was going to happen. So who was right about World War One? M. Smith, president of the RLBS church, the only president of the church to have a PhD, the first graduate of Graceland University, or F. Henry Edwards, a 19-year-old young adult and prisoner of His Majesty's government. The First World War was a tragic and unnecessary conflict. These are the first words of John Keegan's book, The First World War. John Keegan <clears throat> was a military uh, historian. World War I began as a local conflict that should not have gone global. We had European empires in conflict, including the British Empire. It was the first mechanized, chemicalized, industrialized global war. There were eight and a half million military deaths, six to 13 million civilian deaths, and 50 million deaths from Spanish flu incubated in the trenches in France and on the ships that brought the troops home. Michael Kazin sums up <clears throat> uh, the, the view of historians. He says, historians both left and right now see the First World War as a terrible and tragic mistake. In <clears throat> World War I, the Bolshevik Revolution happened in 1917 in Russia. It's doubtful that it would have happened if World War I was not in progress. It ended empires like the Austria-Hungary Empire and also the Ottoman Empire. It redrew the maps of the Middle East with consequences that we're still feeling today. World War II followed caused by World War I and the unjust peace through the Versailles uh, Treaty uh, in 1919. World War II saw the Holocaust of six million Jews, five million other people. It saw the development and the use of the atom bomb. And the Cold War followed World War II. Matthew Naylor, is president and CEO of the National World War I Museum in Kansas City. And he says this, World War I was the founding catastrophe of the 20th century. Let's look a little bit now at the found at Henry Edwards. So let me take you to Birmingham, England. Birmingham is Britain's large, second largest city. It's in the English Midlands. And F. Henry Edwards was born the 4th of August, 1897. His parents were LDS seekers, baptized RLDS in 1883. He was baptized at the age of eight, 1905, a familiar story, and ordained a priest in 1916. He was training as an accountant, left school maybe 15 or 16, which was unusual because most kids left school at 12 or 13 at that time. And this is the house in which he was born. The bottom is a T-junction, a, caf a cafe, but you see the narrow row house, three floors. Um, this is a working class dwelling. And the Great War began on August the 4th for Britain in 1914. It was F. Henry's 17th birthday. There was a carnival atmosphere, young men enlisted as though going to a game. Be home by Christmas was everyone's cry. Poets talked about noble patriotism. By Christmas 1914 though, nearly 200,000 British soldiers were already dead. That was the bulk of the regular army. 
It was a volunteer army, different to continental Europe, because the English Channel and the best navy in the world um, made a volunteer army sufficient before this time. Edward's first publication was a letter written on the 13th of February, 1915. And he's age 17 when he writes this. And I quote from his letter, my fellow countrymen are making great sacrifices for their king and country. And I want to be willing to give my life if needs be for my king, the king of kings, and for the establishment of his kingdom, to be a patriot in the great sense. So this is the only rationale we have for conscientious objector by any of the eight Latter-day Saint conscientious objectors in World War I. I'm impressed by his thinking. He speaks of king and country, but then speaks about the, his personal king with a capital K, the king of kings. And here there's an echo of a tune from and, and song from uh, the Messiah, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, a scripture that comes from the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. And for the establishment of his kingdom, God's kingdom, a worldwide kingdom, and he claims to be a patriot in that greater sense. What's also significant is that the work, the RLDS mission, began in Germany also in 1914. And you know the close fellowship we enjoy in the church. It was unthinkable for F. Henry Edwards to go to war and think of killing by accident or design another member of the church. So let's talk now about the road to conscription, the road to the draft. Initially, as I've already mentioned, the British army was a volunteer army. And then as, uh, the war continued in the trenches in France, there was a shortage of soldiers. The Military Service Act came into force January the 27th, 1916. This introduced conscription or the draft. And by March the 2nd, all unmarried men between the ages of 18 and 41 were liable for the draft. Conscientious objection was allowed by this act their cases would become before local tribunals, what Americans call the draft board. And these in Britain in World War I were not well or fairly run. They were supposed to be almost like a court with clear due process, but that was not the case. Appeal was hardly ever successful. Later on, there was a central tribunal where a further appeal for those in prison for their conscientious objective stand was possible. We'll come back to the Central Tribunal in a moment. F. Henry Edwards turned 18 years old on August the 4th, 1915. Lloyd George, Secretary of State for War and later Prime Minister, wanted the path for conscientious objectors to be a very hard one. So prison was hard labor, very cold in winter, very hot in summer. Today will be an insufferable day. Insufficient food intentionally to weaken people's resistance. They will be alone in their cell. No visits or letters for the first two months and the silence rule, which meant the prisoners could not talk to one another. There was also punishment. Let me demonstrate to you field punishment number one. Field punishment number one was to be changed, chained to or roped to a fence or to a post and had the nickname crucifixion. It was a torture to be subjected to this. And in the film Archibald Baxter, New Zealander, you have him shown in this punishment. Let me tell you about the Frenchman who was sent uh, to France in May, June, <clears throat> 1916. 
There was about 45 of them. They were conscientious objectors and they were sent to France to be executed in France on French soil. It was a harrowing experience for them. What saved them is that one of them wrote a note, wrapped it in a stone and tossed it out of his railway carriage onto the station platform. Someone picked it up and posted it to his family who then got in touch with Quaker members of parliament who spoke with the prime minister and got the execution stopped. So F. Henry Edwards did not know whether he was going to be executed when he began this road. So let's talk a little bit about the suffering of COs in Britain in World War I. 73 conscientious objectors died from their treatment. 31 conscientious objectors went insane. It was indeed a very hard road. So let's now look at F. Henry Edwards' journey. He was not granted conscientious objector status by the tribunal. Unfortunately, we don't have his record before the tribunal because they were destroyed after the war. His voice, with many others, forever silenced. His appeal apparently failed. He was arrested at home in December 1916. He would have been advised by the uh, No Conscription Fellowship to await his arrest at home. Begin your resistance at home. He was taken to a magistrate's court, fined two pounds, which was more than two, um, two weeks uh, wages, and then handed over to the Worcester Regiment at the Norton Army Barracks in Worcester. These are the buildings today of the Norton Army Barracks. It is quite intimidating to walk through these doors of a Gothic fortress style building. We found his record, uh, and I thank Peter Judd for this. And this is his induction page. You'll notice that it's burned around the edges because the records were subject to a fire. And if we look close at it, you'll see at the top his name written uh, in handwriting, not his. And then you see that he begins to sign his name thinks about it, crosses it out, and begins disobeying orders. And below it says, uh, refuses medical examination as a conscientious objector. And the regimental conduct sheet says that while on active service, he disobeyed a lawful command given by his superior officer. The two witnesses were sergeants. He was sentenced to the court martial to 112 days hard labor. And he was sent to His Majesty's prison, Wormwood Scrubs in London. So Wormwood Scrubs, he was probably sewing mailbags in solitary confinement in his cell. He was one of almost 6,000 prisoners, uh, conscientious objectors in prisons in Britain. There was scandal in Parliament and the press. This led to the Home Office scheme for conscientious objectors, but with a central tribunal to judge genuineness. So on the 30th of January, 1917, <clears throat> Edwards appeared before the central tribunal, Lord Richard Cavendish and Sir Francis Gore. Now I want you to get British society here. We're much more class orientated and class divided than in the United States. Lord Richard Cavendish and Sir Francis Gore are aristocracy. They would speak with a posh accent. And F. Henry Edwards was a 19 year old working class lad who spoke with a Birmingham accent, a Brummie accent working class boy before intimidating aristocracy. Do you sense the situation? However, they judge him to be a genuine conscientious objector. And these are the minutes from the central tribunal for that day. And I've read um, 
his name, his number, and the fact that he got a, an A classification that meant there was no doubts about his uh, conscientious objection. So he was one of 4,000 who took part in the home office scheme. A further thousand refused to participate in that. They were absolutists, but F. Henry Edwards was not. So this is a Dartmoor prison. And these are the officers outside the gates. This is also a terrible prison. It was built in the Napoleonic Wars for French prisoners of war. And then when Britain entered into war against the United States, American prisoners were held here also. So it's over a thousand feet high, which is high in Britain. So you often have misty, clammy days where the clouds surround the building. So F. Henry Edwards, with a thousand other conscientious objectors, was held here for two years. He was a religious objector. Uh, in this place, 25% of the population were religious objectors, but three quarters were socialists or political objectors. He was held here from March the 9th, 1917, to March 1919. So he was there for two years. He had to do work of national importance. And that for F. Henry Edwards was work in the kitchen. Now you'd think that he would develop some excellent cooking skills. But if you talk with Paul Edwards, he, he would say his pies were awful and his cocoa was more awful. It was a nine hour work day. Locks were taken off the cells. These young, ethical, conscientious objectors ran things. There were evening classes, and it's possible that F. Henry Edwards' competence in shorthand was developed in one of these classes. The Bishop of Exeter, the Church of England bishop, forbade the use of the chapel. Now, if the conscientious objectors were common murderers or common uh, criminals, they would have been able to enjoy the grace of the Church of England, but not conscientious objectors. However, F. Henry Edwards went by bicycle on Sundays to the RLDS branch in Exeter. And I heard this story from a former member of uh, this RLDS branch who still lived in Exeter. Now, it was around five and a half hours round trip by bicycle to go to church on a Sunday uh, by F. Henry Edwards. This is a picture of some of the conscientious objectors. I guess it's a Sunday because they're all dressed in their Sunday best. And this is another picture uh, of uh, conscientious objectors at Dartmoor. There's one silly woman there, perhaps somebody's wife or girlfriend. I've looked at both pictures and I can't find F. Henry Edwards' face. So I think he was on his bicycle, either going to or in church or on his way back home. The Quakers, because of their pacifism and understanding and appreciation of conscientious objectors, visited F. Henry Edwards on the 28th of August, 1917. And I was thrilled to be able to see their handwritten notes about this visit for F. Henry Edwards. F. Henry Edwards later on said, uh, and Paul Edwards is the one telling me this story, that he said that if he was not RLDS, he would have been Quaker. Let's pause now and look at what was the position of the RLDS church at this time about the war, about conscientious objection. Well, let's go to Nauvoo. Uh, here is a John Hafen painting uh, of the last speech that Joseph Jr. made on June the 18th, 1844. Here is before the Nauvoo Legion and Joseph is Lieutenant General, the only American to hold that time after George Washington. The militia, the Nauvoo militia at this time was 5,000 men strong. 
only the US Army at 8,000 men was bigger. So we have a militaristic past. Joseph Smith III, however, was more his mother's boy than his dad's son. And he, in his memoirs, is critical of Nauvoo militarism. In the uh, American Civil War, he considered enlisting and joined with others in a prayer meeting to discern whether that should happen or not. And the answer they felt from the Holy Spirit was that they should not enlist but if they were drafted, they should go. Another indication of his peaceableness is Lamoni, that became the headquarters of the RLDS church at one time, and greetings to anyone here from Lamoni on this call. Lamoni is significant, is the name of the only pacifist king in the Book of Mormon. Of course, our peace direction is further helped by the design of the church peace logo. He forgave Thomas C. Sharp, an editor of a newspaper, a uh, neighboring newspaper, who <clears throat> was fierce in his criticism of the Latter-day Saints and was almost certainly involved in his father's death. He participated in the Parliament of World Religions in 1893 a marvelous event in Chicago. And he supported in one of his last editorials in the Saints Herald, President Wilson's neutrality stand for the United States as the First World War began in 1914. And here's the logos, the first, as it were, as it were the first designs, 1874, and then in 1891. So, as I've already mentioned, Joseph III supported USA neutrality, and his son, who was in the presidency, F.M. Smith, would of course know about that, knew about that. The United States entered World War I in 1917, almost three years later. It was on the 6th of April. It was Good Friday. It was pregnant with tra tragedy for the world and big, big mistakes for churches, including the RLDS churches. F.M. Smith was now president of the church from 1915. He says this, from the mouths of slackers and cowardly pacifists have gone out expressions which do violence to our real stand. I will not stand for it. So you can see he's not enthusiastic about conscientious objectors. And in World War II, I understand, he was a colonel in the um, uh, Nauvoo uh, uh, Guard. So it's in the um, Missouri Guard. He believed in the social gospel and he's good and strong on that, but he's a USA nationalist. And it's about obey the law of the land. Boy, young man, if you're drafted, you must go whether it's to serve the Kaiser, His Majesty the King, or the United States. After the war, the Princeton Work Center closed in April 1919, and F. Henry Edwards would have been released by this time. He was formally released from the Army Reserve on March the 31st, 1920. He lost his job at the accounts office and never qualified as an accountant. His colleagues and the clients didn't want to have to deal with a conscientious objector. The road is still a very hard one for conscientious objectors. He did become the secretary to the RLDS British Isles mission. And you get a sense that he was organized, good at paperwork and because of some mathematical ability, very good at statistics. Initially, some walked out when he preached, but he eventually won most. And when I was researching F. Henry Edwards some years ago, um, I used to pick up uh, between Sunday school and the worship service, Ida Dix, an ancient uh, Latter-day Saint, <laughs> wonderful lady. She always ministered to me. And I was explaining that I was talking about, researching about F. Henry Edwards. 
and his conscientious objector stand. And she knew immediately about the trouble in the Birmingham congregation. She said there was trouble. It divided the congregation. And when the Edwards family came into worship, some members of the congregation would sing to the tune, God is marshalling our army. We will have no cowards in our rank. He began work, though, in 1920 as a full-time uh, missionary for the RLDS Church. So you can see that he's being, becoming trusted in the church. F.M. Smith came to Britain on a long missionary visit in 1920. He's been president of the church for five years and felt uh, that he should come to Britain. Of course, World War I would have hindered that coming before. He needed a secretary. No one had thought about this. And F. Henry Edwards was chosen. You're it, his uh, superiors said. Let's look at the first meeting. He says this. I went to his room, F. M. Smith's room, the first time in fear and trembling but soon found that he was kindness personified. When I settled in a little, I even ventured a question or two. For me, it was like a course in church administration. So this is an astonishing encounter. But I think we understand it because we may have different political or religious positions, but when we meet each other, in fellowship in our congregations or in reunions. We lay those things aside and embrace one another with love. And that's what happened here. And I think this is a very significant encounter. Here we have uh, an extract of a priesthood gap. It's a large photo, again, still in Britain. And Edwards is in the back row. And F.M. Smith is in the front row in the center. Edwards is just behind him. Now, one of the jobs F.M. Smith gave F. Henry Edwards was to compile a list of young people who might be potential students at Graceland University. Edwards kept putting his own name on the list, and F.M. Smith kept ignoring it until one day he accepted an Edwards um, was sent to the United States. Here is an identity card. It says that he arrived in New York on the 9th of September, 1921. He was later naturalized on the 19th of uh, December, 1938. And he's naturalized as an American citizen so he can continue to serve on the board of the church's radio station. Graceland University, or college, I should say, at this time. Uh, he was a student here for one year. So F. Henry Edwards had a college education, but he didn't have a college degree. He was called into the Council of Twelve Apostles at the age of 25 in 1922. He was the youngest ever called into the Council of Twelve. In 1946, he was called into the First Presidency and released in 1966. So he served in the leading quorums of the church for over 40 years. He was counselor to President Israel A. Smith and President Wallace Smith. In this picture, you see the family of Joseph III, and I think this is probably in, Le, in Lamoni. And uh, you see Joseph III with his nicely trimmed beard. And then you see uh, seated down with a bow tie, F.M. Smith. And then you see to one side, Alice, F.M. Smith's daughter, Ruth Smith's daughter. Well, Alice is important. She becomes Mrs. Edwards, and here she is. And F. Henry and Alice were married for 50 years, and uh, 
their two sons, Paul and Lyman, are still alive today. So let's summarize. F. Henry Edwards was an existentialist, although he did not know it, according to very fondly of him. He spoke French and Spanish and passable German. He wrote over 500 articles, over 36 books and texts. And Paul Edwards in his um, book about his dad calls him articulated for the church. Now, a Keith Wilson, a professor at Brigham Young University in the religion department, uh, did some work on F. Henry Edwards and he worked out how many pages F. Henry Edwards wrote and had published. And he estimates that F. Henry Edwards is the most uh, prolific church leader author in any Latter-day Saint tradition, RLDS or LDS. So uh, Paul tells how he would get up early in the morning. I mean, early, early. <laughs> and right before the day began. He was very prolific. Now, Paul is also very prolific. And Paul pointed out in one of our discussions that he's written over 50 books. Now, <clears throat> F. Henry Edwards was a very able administrator. He was a good minister. He knew people by name. And Jewel is with me this evening. And she says that every time F. Henry Edwards and she passed, he knew her name. F. Henry Edwards was a theological innovator. He introduced grace into the church. And uh, Jeff Spencer tells of a sermon that he was torn whether to attend or not because he had college exams in his teacher college, important for his degree, or going to listen to F. Henry Edwards. So he compromised, he took his books to swat in church, but didn't look at them because it's utterly gripped by the sermon that F. Henry Edwards preached in the Dremoyne congregation in Sydney, Australia on grace. Grace came into our tradition through F. Henry Edwards. He was always one for making peace in the church. In his last article in the Saints Herald, September, 1985, a very coherent piece was let contention cease. He was never strident about his positions. He went for long-term relationships and long-term change. So if I'm an activist, he was not an activist. He held the same positions, but it was about long-term relationships and long-term change that he was going for. He inspired British conscientious objectors in World War II. He was one of only two RLDS conscience objectors in World War I. The other was a, a, a farmer um, uh, in Missouri. In summary, Paul Edwards says this, a particular note should be taken of Frank Edwards' lifelong advocacy for peace. But in all fairness, it was more than that. It was the abhorrence of war. of human potential and the destruction of both human life and human values as well. So let's uh, review the larger context. Again, to quote John Keegan's first words in his book on World War I, the First World War was a tragic and unnecessary conflict. Conscientious objectors were part of a bigger resistance to war in World War I. There were soldier poets, Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon are two of the most famous. These were soldiers who volunteered for their country. 
and then experience the terribleness and also futility of the war and put their feelings into profound poetry that are still studied by English children today in school. There were the socialists who refused to go to work, to, to go, refused to go to war against other working class men in other countries. Their voices were very important. There were many women who were part of the resistance to the war. And there were soldiers who could not shoot on the front line. And they're not known, they're anonymous, only known to God and themselves. And then there were the conscientious objectors. Bennett and Howlett, this is not David Howlett, by the way, but the Charles Howlett, two historians uh, say this, conscientious objectors were the shock troops of anti-war dissent in World War I. So, conscientious objectors today. Edward's story and that of other CEOs can inspire us today. But you might ask, how can we be conscientious objectors today? Well, we can object to war still. But we can also object to poverty, climate change, racism, sexism, political corruption. So conscientious objectors can be role models of people who think for themselves, who have empathy and feeling for their fellow human being and take action to do something about it. Here in Lamoni are the graves of Leth Henry and his wife, 50 years, Alice. But who was right about World War I? Was it F.M. Smith, president of the RLDS Church, in his prime, a PhD? Or was it a young adult, a young working class man, F. Henry Edwards, a conscientious objector who went to prison for his courage? If you want more information after we've done the Q&A uh, on F. Henry Edwards, on the forthcoming Peace Colloquy, or on the online course that I'm involved in on four different nonviolence, do email, simple to remember email address, abolton2 at live.com. abolton2 at live.com. I welcome your emails and I promise to answer you. So I'm going to now go back to uh, hand over to Barbara. Well, thank you, Andrew. Wow. Thank you for sharing this analysis of F. Henry Edwards and F.M. Smith's views regarding World War I and more. I also want to take a minute to thank Megan for all that she has done this evening and fielding questions and the behind the scenes work. I want to thank Peter for keeping an eye on the chats and the questions and for simply being Peter. And again, thank you to all of the attendees, especially those who have stuck around the, for the extra time uh, for joining us this evening and especially for asking those questions. Until next Thursday, take care everyone and good night.